This week, we meet the middlemen standing between you and your games console. We're letting off some steam, and we have an amazing spider, man. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. Lara Lewington, what is the craziest thing you've ever bought on eBay? Um, slippers? Dogs, dog slippers. I wonder where that was going. OK, I did ask for crazy. Well, look, do you remember the times when you bid on an item and you thought you were going to win the auction and then in the dying few seconds you were beaten by someone else? Yes, they weren't real people though, were they? No, they weren't. They were computer programmes designed to work really fast and beat you to the bid button and I hated them. No one did that to my dog slippers though. Can't imagine why. Well, look, now this idea is being used in new ways and Omar Metab has been looking at the phenomenon of the scalpers. With the pandemic came lockdowns, and with the majority of the population stuck at home, we had nothing really to do but buy. And so online spending went up. We bought clothes, hobby kits, sourdough starters, fire pits, hot tubs, gym equipment, anything to get us through it. And that includes gaming consoles like the brand new PS5. There was a problem, the semiconductor shortage. The shortage of semiconductors. They don't have the semiconductors. Why is that? Simply put, they are the brains of modern electronics. So, they're in pretty much every product. Electronics need them. Cars, smartphones, laptops, gaming consoles. And so with very few on the market, fans are fighting on websites to try and get them. However, there is money to be made. In come the scalpers. So these are people who buy rare or sought after items and resells them again at a higher price to make a profit. Now you've probably seen them outside of concerts, reselling tickets or putting up a nice pair of shoes up on eBay for double the price. But the modern scalper is a little bit different. They use internet bots, online software that's programmed to do a certain task. So that could be buying the first tickets available for a trip to Mallorca, telling me when the Ferrari Testarossa is under 100K, or telling me when a stock of PS5 appears on a website. And when you've got a bot, there's almost no limit to how many you could buy to allow you to resale. And the fact is, whether you like it or not, scalping and the use of stock check bots are legal. Douglas, well, could you give a clap for me, please? This is Douglas Chapman, an MP leading the charge in proposing to ban the resale of gaming consoles purchased with automated bots. I think it's skewing the market beyond what's reasonable. And, you know, I think we need to look as well about what are the protections for the consumer returns policy, for example, if something is not working properly? Uh, uh, you know, how does it affect guarantees? Um, are they paying tax? Are they paying VAT? Are they registered for VAT? Now, they're purely trying to make a, a quick buck on the back of you know, somebody who's desperate. It's just on the edge ethically, but it's also on the edge commercially, I think. So when most physical shops were closed, it meant that scalpers could clean up giving them an unfair advantage over everyone else, including me. Most websites sold out within minutes, and I didn't want to pay up to a grand buying it from a scalper. Instead, I used a free stock checker, which relies on word of mouth from shop employees to predict stock releases. But it was often futile against the scalper's bots. Uh -huh. All right. What? I'm sorry. So, I would often find myself waiting up to 2, 3 a.m. on Argos' website, refreshing like mad, before finally getting lucky. And after seven months. I'm all right, I'm all right. Man. 
So, I wanted to know who was stopping me from buying one of these for so long. This is Jack, a scalper. He got into reselling years ago and made big money. For example, by flipping 150 pound Yeezys for up to 1,000 pounds. He's a former investment banker who used to make around 1,500 quid a month. And he's given up that day job. Why? Because since setting up aftermarket arbitrage, his reselling company about 18 months ago, he claims that he's made 456,000 pounds in revenue in subscriptions alone. He helps others resell with a plethora of channels stacked with info, tutorials and advice on the social platform Discord, which people pay at least a £30 a month subscription to be a part of. His bots provide notifications to his 1,200 paying followers when a rare item is suddenly in stock, and he can even auto-buy it if the bot is powerful enough. And with so many subscribers, you can see why scalping might be on the rise. However, these bots aren't easy to maintain. When I first started in like trainers, there was maybe like three bots, and now there is hundreds. A lot of the bots that have been developed are all by very young kids, and these are young entrepreneurs that are making a lot of money from producing this software. It gets very expensive to run a bot. This is what people don't think about. So we do that, we handle everything, and then you just sit back and wait for your success email. But why does it get expensive to run a bot? Because this is like where websites, for example, will put like anti-bot um, protection on the website. So we have to use a lot of proxies. So say you want to get 100 pairs of trainers from that one bot and you're on one IP, the website that you're trying to acquire the shoes from is going to know that you're bombarding their servers and they're going to know what you're doing because it's not physically possible that there's 100 people trying to spam that auto check, uh, that add to basket button. So what the bot will do is you buy proxies and it assigns like one proxy to one task. Mm -hmm. So it looks like these 100 tasks are in 100 different locations run by one person. So it means that it looks legit. very legit. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't just consoles. They scalped seasonal gifts during Christmas, outdoor furniture and swimming pools during the summer. They were involved in pretty much everything. But no doubt it was his lot that were buying up the PS5s. So I put it to him how this caused problems for so many. Isn't that creating unfair competition? Yeah, it is. But I think if you look at any marketplace and anywhere where you see a um, supply and demand sort of like issue, you're going to see people exploiting that. If there's an arbitrage opportunity, people are going to capitalise on it. It's like, why would you leave the money on the table? There will be people out there mm -hmm. paying more than what they should do for these products. Yeah. So is that not morally reprehensible at the end of the day? I don't, I wouldn't class not having a PS5 as suffering. Like, I think that's a luxury. It was a combative chat with questions of legality, morals, ethics, and he wouldn't back down. If you look at every step in the supply chain, Sony buying these chips, they're going to pay whatever they're going to pay. They're then going to add a markup on that, aren't they, when they give it to a retail, let's say Currys. Currys are then going to buy it and then sell it at a markup cost. But so we're just an extra step in that supply chain. Is it's that all... the justification for it, though? Because you see it elsewhere, therefore it must be all right. There's people out there that want to do a little bit more outside the 9 to 5. And if you see a, a, um, a, a friction between supply and demand, you are going to see someone capitalising on it. Not everyone knows that these bots exist to be able to make that process easier. Yeah. So to those people, do they deserve to have their ability to shop for these items taken away from them because there's someone else out there that is using tech? It's not that hard to get a console. How have we got people that are getting hundreds of consoles and yes, you've got someone complaining that they can't get their hands on one, and I get it, but there's an answer and there's a solution. And as scalping has become more popular and the public becomes more aware of it, people like Jack receive death threats on a regular basis, which, come on, is never right. Like, i am being genuine sexually now, I've been inundated with death threats, people threatening to turn up to my house, I've seen like pet posts all over social media, like, with people like making threats about me, making comments about me and my family, like. I'm sorry, I'm, so, I'm sorry yeah. to hear that. But one thing you also said during our chat interested me, that there is more than one reason why someone would scalp. Sure, with his walls of Xboxes and PS5s behind us, he wanted to show off how much he earned. But he did speak of others that got into scalping, not for greed. So I spoke to a few of them. 
There was one who had a gambling debt of 30k that he, he cleared away with the money that he earned. And another who used it to restructure his life and step away from alcoholism. But because of what happened with Jack, they didn't want to be filmed in fear of their safety. But there was one who was comfortable enough to be on camera. Loaded. Uh, got a long-standing medical issue. As a result of it, it, it got me into quite a lot of debt. Reckon about fifty thousand pounds. Wife unfortunately lost her work as a beautician, so that put a further strain. So I had to think of what other things we could do. So I looked into reselling. I was doing it for family and friends, really. I was getting, you know, not much money out of it, but it was enough to eat away at the debt slowly. And what would happen if you weren't able to make that extra money from reselling? The reality is we could end up losing the house and things like that, our valuables that we own. I've got young kids, and when you've got to put food on the table, you've got to do what you've got to do, as long as it's not criminal, which this isn't. I uh, actually interviewed an MP who's looking to lead um, the charge in Parliament to legislate against the use of bots. Yeah, I do think bots should be stopped and what the MP is doing, I fully support it. There are some people that will do this 24-7 and I'm aware of people that have got 10, 15, 20 computers set up and running these bots. They are stockpiling playstations and trainers and toys, almost market manipulating. I'd memorise my credit card details, but even then you're still looking at 30 odd seconds and things are going out of stock that quickly. And so it seems like you are actually against the, the concept of modern day scalping. Yeah, it contradicts what I do, but if it wasn't for reselling, it'd be a completely different situation, I think, where I wouldn't have a roof over my head. And mentally, it would have just completely killed me. When I first started this journey, I thought it was a simple story about people trying to make a quick buck. Chances using bots to supercharge their earnings. What I didn't expect to find were people struggling to make ends meet and turning to scalping to help out. Sure, people like Shiraz don't represent the majority who do this for greed. However, this minority does exist. And you can argue that they're not doing anything that wrong. Remember, currently, this is legal. But should it be? Quite a lot of that activity is either related to uh, organised crime or it's related to people trafficking. You know, I take the, your view that, you know, there are individuals out there where it's, it's, it's made a difference to their lives. Um, but, you, that's, but that's the reason as well we want the regulation. If they're entrepreneurs, then they're living within the same rules as somebody who's um, setting up a, a high street shop. The bill Mr Chapman had brought forward had failed recently, but he's renewing it again this year. There is no doubt that bots make scalping a lot more ferocious than it ever was, giving tech-powered resellers an edge that us, the consumers, can never compete with. So what do you think? Should it be outlawed? Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week TikTok suspended live streaming from its service in Russia. Netflix is also no longer available there. Spotify and Discord are recovering from an outage affecting thousands of users, likely due to a cloud networking issue. And Google subsidiary Jigsaw will make its web-based harassment manager open source, potentially allowing more people to manage online abuse. Staying with Google and its latest Google Meet update now tells people your real-time connection status. Yes, no more pretend static noises or saying there's a bad signal. These graphs return exactly how much bandwidth is available. Quick Apple roundup for you now as it's announced new computers, smartphones and tablets. The new fifth generation iPad Air was among the announcements and even the iPhone SE got an upgrade at last. Apple also displayed a new display and a £129 cable. And finally, a Twitter bot caused a sensation by revealing organisations' current gender pay gaps on International Women's Day. 
at PayGap app started retweeting companies with stats drawn from the UK government website. Some companies deleted their own International Women's Day status updates after being retweeted with their PayGap. Handheld gaming is rarely about raw power. Handheld devices tend to double down on fun, pure gameplay experiences that don't rely on graphics so sharp you'll cut yourself on them. That could be about to change as a result of this. The Steam Deck, a handheld gaming PC. From Valve, the people behind legendary games like Half-Life 1 and 2, as well as the Steam Digital Store, which dominates the PC gaming scene. The device itself feels a little bit like a Switch, which has been down to the gym and spent a lot of time working out. It has a grown-up feel to it. There's a seven-inch touchscreen, and although it's quite big, it's reasonably comfortable to use over long periods of time because it's not actually that heavy. Gaming on PC relies on keyboard and mouse, which offers you an enormous amount of options. On a handheld, you just don't have the same kind of real estate, but the Steam Deck does have plethora of control options. Touchscreen, joysticks, haptic force feedback, touchpads, D-pad, triggers, A, B, X, Y, and grip buttons underneath. All of them combine to make the PC gaming experience on the move work. The weird thing about playing a game that you're so used to playing on keyboard and mouse is that with a controller and this kind of setup, it's not quite as comfortable, but the touchpad here is really making up that lack of mouse. The big advantage that this machine has over most new devices is its enormous library of games. While well, most consoles have to rely on a really strong launch lineup like the Switch with Zelda Breath of the Wild or the PS5 with Spider-Man and things like that, Steam is launching with its own platform, with thousands upon thousands of games. That is something that no other console has ever been able to rely on, which puts it in such a unique position in the market. Not all of the games in that huge library are optimised for play on the Steam Deck. Games like Control or Fallout New Vegas all work fine though, even with the graphic settings maxed out. But Maxing out the graphics has a drastic effect on battery life. Valve say the Steam Deck's battery will run for eight hours on low-end games or simple tasks, but if you play graphics and processor-intensive titles, expect that battery life to drop to something like two hours. Valve is best known as a games company, and the Steam Store is by far the largest digital distribution platform as far as PC games are concerned. But its previous forays into hardware haven't always enjoyed the same success as its games. They've had a disastrous time. They launched these things called Steam Machines that were sort of jumped up PCs that didn't really have any benefit. Um, they've lost a bunch of money on VR headsets with a thing called Valve Index. It's tried to make its own controller that was kind of trying to make a mouse into a controller, which was very confusing and not that successful. But with this, it's sort of presenting its own version of the Switch. How do you see the life cycle for the Steam Deck? Is it going to be like a console where you change the machine every five years? Or is it going to be more like a PC where you upgrade over the course of the machine's life? Uh, it's very much a PC and we approach it like a PC. Some of the benefits that you get by having a fixed hardware target in the console market don't really translate to the traditional PC space. It's also start to look at mobile specific uh, opportunities to expand the PC gaming space. So if you look at something like Pokemon Go, it really has no analog in the desktop computer. Like the whole point of it is to be out and about. So the next stage for us, what are the mobile specific opportunities? The Steam Deck isn't perfect. The device itself is lacking that premium feel. The plastics feel a little bit low end. And as I've said, battery life can be variable. There are other handheld PCs out there, but in terms of specification, they all cost quite a bit more than this does. PC gaming has endured several console life cycles and will no doubt evolve beyond the current console's state of the art. Let's see if handheld PC devices like this one are a new evolutionary branch to the long-standing PC story.
That was Mark with the new Steam Deck. Now, it's Oscars season, and every year we like to take a look at the contenders in the best visual effects category. Last week it was the new Matrix film. What did you think of it? Yeah. Have you seen the new Spider-Man film, No Way Home? I have, and I loved it, as did the critics and the box office. Nearly $2 billion taken worldwide so far. Thank you very much. So here is an in-depth look at one of the key sequences where Spider-Man is reunited with some old foes. Ever since I got bit by that spider, I've only had one week where my life has felt normal. The great thing about the highway fight is that it's kind of contained on this bridge. The bad thing about it is that it's essentially like an all CG environment that is in broad daylight with two hero characters fighting. Shooting did take place during the middle of the pandemic, so we really weren't able to shoot anything uh, on location in New York. Um, we sent a small team there and they did some photographic reference. They had a couple of days in a helicopter where they shot um, some aerial footage for us. But the majority of the actual plate photography with the real actors was done in Atlanta on um, a stage there. So they built like a 200 foot long piece of highway with real cars. And that's where uh, Tom Holland and Alfred Molina actually were physically there fighting each other. We did have to then fill in the entire environment around that because it's a very small set. And for the most part, Tom is in his Iron Spider suit, so he's all CG. Doc Ock is, has these big giant CG arms and when they're fighting, he's CG. And if they're throwing around cars or doing anything crazy, you know, sometimes the entire frame is CG. So what we had to do was start with a scan and a lot of photographic reference of that environment. And then from that, build like just a very accurate photo reel representation of about three square miles of New York. The way we did it was we started with reference photography. We lined up maybe 10 to 15 angles from different parts of the bridge, looking out in different directions. And then we started matching that with our CG environment. And just every day we would iterate three, four or five times and just try and get closer and closer and closer to the real thing. And I think at the end of the day, we had something like 500 unique assets you know, 70 cars. Uh, we had to build a traffic system to drive cars around in the background uh, so that that would, you know, give life back there. We had a crowd system for character, uh, the actual uh, human beings walking around in the background. And then, you know, at render time, when all of that's brought in, it probably like 30 billion polygons or something are, are being rendered in any given shot. Alfred uh, Molina, you know, he's on a um, basically this platform that they can uh, float around to give him height and move him around like the legs are carrying him. That was a little more difficult in the sense that his uh, feet are flat on there, his legs aren't really dangling, and his coat uh, gets caught up on this rig quite a bit. So most of the time when you see uh, Doc Ock from the neck, you know, a full body frame of him or even mid body frame of him, uh, he's usually all CG from the neck down. Um, and sometimes even have to reproduce his hair and put digital hair on him just to get like the sense of motion that he's moving quickly forward or doing some kind of action that he wasn't really doing. So you get that wind blowing in his hair, you get the jacket moving properly, his legs dangling. Um, and we always needed to keep realism and weight and speed and, you know, action going with that character. So, you know, we did try and ground that in a lot of Tom's performance or stunt performances when they're actually doing those things and we enhance them, but the base is usually um, either match move or motion capture of a real actor. And next week we'll go behind the scenes of another big blockbuster as we continue down the road to Oscar glory. Uh, whatever that means. Uh, anyway, that's it from us for this week. <laughs> As ever, you can keep up with the team on social media. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.